No introduction, at least to all of us, I hope. And if she'll come on up and talk to us. Thanks. Good, so let me tell you about myself. <laughs> can, is that, can you hear me? Is, is, this, is this an overhead mic? Or this is the overhead mic? Okay. Okay, so I need to stay right here for you all to help, to be able to hear me, right? Let me do this, this is better. I'm so tall. Um, hey, good afternoon, I'm glad everybody's here. Um, how is everyone? Great. Great. You feeling good? Yeah? Good? I am too. I'm feeling good about a lot of things. Uh, not particularly the session that I'm supposed to talk about, but because we had such a pitiful, awful, no good, terrible, slimy <laughs> session, um, it's looking good for our races, which is great. We're, we're uh, recruiting the best candidates, I think probably field of candidates that we've had in a long, long time because of what's happening in the sessions and how frustrated uh, people feel out there in the field. And so the, the uh, Democrats are having a really good time uh, selecting candidates. Uh, even here in our own area, we've got uh, some great candidates coming forward to take some seats that are vacating and we're just really excited about all of that. Wouldn't it be great for Boone County to pick up, I don't know, one, maybe two seats? It's, it's eminently doable. It's eminently doable. All we have to do is get out there and work for the candidates that show up. Um, I wanted to let you all know that I haven't been purposefully missing mule skinners, and I haven't just been lazy. I have been, uh, since session, I've been in Denver for a wedding, and I've been in uh, Washington, D.C. for a conference, and I've been in Africa. And that's not Africa, Missouri. <laughs> That's Africa, Africa, uh, Ghana, Africa. My husband, uh, many of you know, uh, the pastor of First Baptist Church is on a Freedom and Justice Commission for the Baptist World Alliance. Uh, the Baptist World Alliance has 100 million members, and that's even without the Southern Baptists who left in disgust many years ago because they couldn't control the Baptist World Alliance. Um, so they have a broad membership, a very diverse group from all over the world, and they met in Ghana to talk about issues like freedom and justice and uh, very important ethical issues and so on all over the world. Uh, one of the main topics was uh, the, ch the child soldiering that is going on, especially in Africa, and the trafficking of, men, or of women and children also, human trafficking. Very big problems that have gone somewhat under the radar to some degree. Um, and that, so that was just a wonderful, wonderful experience that sometime I hope I get a chance to tell you about. So that's where I've been. I haven't been ignoring anybody here. Um, in fact, I've, I've kept up with you from afar and know that you're still doing great work and have had great programs in my absence. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the session. Why don't we do, uh, I'm going to do a little bit of what some of my accomplishments and hopes and dreams were for the session some that became accomplishments and some that, took, of course, were thwarted on every level. Um, first of all, let, let me tell you a little bit of what I was able to do. And of course, when I say I was able to do, I can only do this by attaching something to somebody else's bill or uh, you know, just giving up ownership. One of those things I got accomplished uh, after several years of working on it was, was probably one of the only truly access um, support it is one of the only truly uh, bills that supported or notions or policies that supported true new access for health care. Uh, and that is that we now have Medicaid is able to pay for a very important um, innovation in medicine, and that's telehealth. The ability to do, um, to uh, enable specialists to get out into rural areas and be able to see people uh, remotely over a, tel uh, a telehealth network. The university has worked on this for years and we were one that were um, one of the states lagging behind in getting it actually paid for. So uh, this improve, will improve access especially in rural areas for the citizens of Missouri to be able to see um, doctors that they normally wouldn't get to see. Uh, so I, I was really proud of that. Uh, I also um, um, sponsored the legislation called Safe at Home with the Secretary of State's office. Secretary Carnahan had um, 
identified this as a real need and offered her services through the Secretary of State's office to make this happen. And this is for the victims of domestic violence, that they can have a safe place for their address. So often the victims of these crimes are re-victimized by a perpetrator who's still out on the streets uh, and able to find them when they are actually trying not to be found. Uh, because uh, the, unfortunately the government requires certain publishing of their addresses on we websites and so on. So this allows them to have a P.O. box with the Secretary of State's office instead of a actual location address and they are then able to, um, they receive mail um, in this P.O. box and the Secretary of State's office then will um, silently pass that on to an address that they have only on record and only um, law, law enforcement by, I think, subpoena, I'm not sure, but they'd have to have a warrant of some sort to get the address if, if needed. So that will protect some victims of domestic violence. I was very proud of getting that put in a bill and passed. Vicki Reback Wilson, many, many years ago, started a piece of legislation for making sure that victims of sexual assault did not have to pay for the forensic exam that goes along with turning someone in. Um, before the law that was passed this year, she, she started the bill and then I carried it for three more years before it even got anywhere. But we finally got it passed this year in the uh, crime victims bill that, you, that the governor came in last week to sign. So my bill and Vicki's bill was in that piece of legislation. We are glad to have that finally a closed chapter. So now the state of Missouri will pay for the forensic exam that a sexual assault victim has to go under. There's also within that piece of legislation some guidelines as to what is involved in a forensic exam and how a, a sexual assault victim would be treated in the emergency room. And those guidelines were very, very necessary because we had some really lax procedures in some ERs uh, and in sheriff's offices around the, uh, around the state. So I'm really proud of that as well. <clears throat> um, so those are the things that I feel like I got accomplished. And I, so I, you know, I feel very good about those, those things. Now let's talk about some things I did that didn't do didn't go anywhere yet, but I'm hoping to do something with them later. And that is, you know, we've had a huge distraction about K through 12 education. What would that distraction possibly be? <laughs> vouchers, 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 vouchers has been the only thing besides the foundation formula that has even been debated in the House for nearly five years, I believe. There's this huge distraction. It finally got a vote this year and was roundly defeated in the legislature this year. So we've been debating something that didn't have a chance even of passing for about five years, and we haven't debate, debated anything else. I had put in um, a bill that would be focused around school improvement and would focus on the, the schools that truly are troubled right now uh, and failing their accreditation. They are provisionally or unaccredited. And I believe that this is the conversation we need to be having. The bill that I put in is the conversation we need to be having, and I will be, again, trying to push it next year. Um, this year I did it as a tax credit bill to just kind of be a companion to their tax credit bill, which is the tax credit voucher bill. Uh, so I said, well, if we do a tax credit, then let's do it for something that truly would improve schools. Next year I will put it in um, as just a straight appropriation. We need to spend about $40 million and that ain't much in a $22 billion budget to do whole school improvement. And this bill li lays out uh, a partnership with a federal program that would allow us even to get more money from the federal program in order to do school improvement. It would be evidence-based, research-based, uh, looking at interventions that have actually made improvements in troubled schools and, and uh, give someone an opportunity and give school districts an opportunity to have a little extra money to try something new um, that would be beneficial to them. Um, health care restoration. I did the health care restoration bill on the House side. Uh, Senator Schumeyer did it on the Senate side. My bill didn't get a hearing. Senator Schumeyer's did, but it just didn't go anywhere. And we'll get to health care in just a minute and what really did happen. But our restoration bill didn't, didn't get very far or a very uh, sound hearing. Um, 
One other thing that I'm quite proud of that I did while I was there this past year is I started what we called the American Dream Caucus. And what it is is an anti-poverty caucus. As I've been in the legislature for the past three years, it has become significantly clear to me that our biggest problem in, in just about every area that we end up uh, needing more money for is actually a problem of poverty. The problem in our schools is basically a problem of increasing poverty in the state of Missouri. Missouri ranks really high on poverty per capita. We, have a, we do have a lot of health care expenditures because a lot of people qualify for our federal program, Medicaid, because they're in poverty. We need to address the root cause of our problem. So the American Dream Caucus has 41 members in it. Um, bicameral, both the Senate and the House members are participating and we have pledged to come up by next session with the five most effective pieces of legislation that if done as a package would make significant improvements in the poverty level of Missourians. It's an anti-poverty caucus. It's kind of in the vein of John Edwards and what he's doing. He has also identified uh, poverty to be one of our major problems. As rich a nation as we have, the most wealthy nation on earth, it's, um, it's just unconscionable that we have the poverty problem that we've got in the state of Missouri. So I'll be working on that. And then I had four energy bills that I put in as well. Uh, and hope to move some of those along next year. They were first year for my energy bills this year, and so I hope to move some of those along next year. Renewable energy, of course, is another one of those things that we must get really, really involved in because the future of our planet, the future of our grandchildren depends on it. So those are some things I did. So now, let's move to the session as it turned out. A stark contrast. <laughs> to what we tried to do in our Moving Missouri Forward uh, Caucus. And first, let me talk about breaking news. I know that some of you know about this. The breaking news is that your contribution counts today better than it did yesterday. <laughs> so this is not about this past session, but this is about, about the session prior to this past session. This is about the 2006 session that passed a repeal of the contribution limits. You, Missourians, in 1994, I believe, passed contribution caps because you thought they were the right thing to do. At 73% of the vote, the vast majority of Missourians were comfortable with some contribution caps. The legislature, in its infinite wisdom in 2006, decided to repeal those caps and it went into the court system, as have a lot of other of the, the past sessions bills ended up in the court's system. Yesterday, the Supreme Court, the state of Missouri, overturned a lower court's decision to uphold that law. So it's done. Caps are, are now put back into place, and like I said, your contribution now counts more than it did yesterday. No longer will single individuals be able to come in and buy elections and buy candidates and buy issues. And if you don't think that was happening, it happened right away. It didn't even stall out for a minute to see what might happen. We had individuals from in-state and out-of-state, and many out-of-state, target Missouri because of its new regulations regarding campaign contribution limits to have rich individuals come in and sway and buy our elections. We are now relieved of that. And what remains is still a question about disgorgement. That just sounds bad, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's what it's called, whether or not the candidates are going to have to give back the money. So we still have yet to hear whether those who've already collected money, who would have a, a vast advantage over anyone still getting in the race, in races uh, they would have. And, and that's a really big question. I mean, it's, we're still 17 months out, right, from the election, and we, there's still some races that don't have candidates in them. 
um, and they would be working at a severe disadvantage if they don't um, decide to to have every, you know level the playing field and have everyone give the money back. Um, but that's yet to be decided. We'll see what the courts do with that. I might add that in this breaking news, so not only did Missouri vote 73 percent to have tuition or to have uh, contribution caps, the Supreme Court voted unanimously on this one. There's no question. <laughs> And there are certain persons on that um, Supreme Court that we were kind of surprised voted this way. But it became abundantly clear that it was the right thing to do. Sean has a comment. Yes, that's who we were just talking about, yes. Um, so so um, I, I'm personally really happy about it. I think it's better for democracy to have uh, people have a better say, uh, you know, that, that the average everyday person has uh, at least a chance of having a say in elections. Okay, let's talk about education. I know that you guys are always interested in education. Um, we didn't do much for education this year, even though the governor likes to trump that he did something and a lot that he gave more money. Well, every year we give more money, okay? Every year we give more money. It's how much more and in how you're trending on that that counts. And uh, frankly, I now sit on the budget committee, which is great. That's good for us. <laughs> I now sit on the budget committee. Um, uh, and hopefully we'll have more and more say as we go forward and close gaps and margins and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, but it became abundantly clear to me that even though there's more money in the education budget, we're and this is kind of an economic term, but you're a smart group of people. I know you'll understand it. We are increasing at a decreasing rate. <laughs> Does that make sense to you all? Sure. We're increasing, but at a decreasing rate. We're not increasing like we did under Carnahan years. You know, we didn't increase, uh, you know, if Democrats were in charge, I mean, when they say it's their priority, it truly is their priority. And the budget right now does not reflect education as the priority in increases. Um, in fact, we have less of a piece of the pie for education now than we did uh, when the governor came into office in 2005. Same with higher education as well. You probably, I think Jeff's already been here and Chuck's already been here, correct? No? Just check. Just check. So he talked a little bit about Mohila, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so I won't spend a lot of time on Mo Mohila, but. Um, just suffice it to say that I have not regretted even one moment the position that I took after you all voted Amendment 2 and put in the Constitution that all research needs to be protected and academic freedom needs to be protected and I took that position and I take it again. Um, and the fact that people would use anything like the cure, finding the cure for cancer as a bully club to punish another person in a political process is just abhorrent to me, frankly. And we've all lost out. All of Missouri has lost out with that process. Um, in, also in education, uh, we still rank very, very low in all of the indicators on education. And there has been no, there's really been no um, significant signal that that's going to change or that that really even matters to the current administration. In fact, it seems to me, frankly, and I think a lot of you out there agree, that it seems to me that there is this push to do privatization even of education and the way to do that is to choke our public school system as best we can and then say, look, they're failing we now have to privatize. Instead of saying public school system is the way to democracy and the only way to democracy and the only way you keep a strong democracy and that we have to protect it and nurture it and care for it, instead we're choking it, I think, in hopes of privatizing it someday. And that has been, frankly, the only conversation in the state of Missouri on education that we've been allowed to have. At this point, the only thing we really need to be doing is talking about school improvement. That needs to be the topic. We have some schools that struggle. We need to talk about what is it and what would it take to improve our schools and to support them the way they need to so that our kids can have the best education 
this nation has to offer. Healthcare. You heard a little bit about MoHealthNet and the healthcare home. Do you all remember the healthcare home that was touted by the MoHealthNet? We contend that it's still the healthcare homeless. We've left so many people still homeless out of health care. You will hear a figure, you will hear the figure 600,000 Missourians are without health insurance. You'll hear that figure, sounds like a lot, doesn't it? That's before the cuts. It hasn't actually been measured <coughs> since the cuts. The 2005 figure is 600,000. 180,000 lost their health care in the Medicaid cuts of 2005. I'm hoping that new figures will come out before we have to vote again so that Missourians can know how much impact this has been on the uninsured. We now have the uninsured population and we call them the healthcare homeless. Um, <clears throat> we tried to do restorations and it was rebuffed pretty much at every corner. Um, I am ranking member now of the Healthcare Policy Committee uh, down at the um, State House and the Healthcare Appropriations Committee. And so we actually got the Healthcare Appropriations Committee to, as its first recommendation, the Healthcare Appropriations Committee, because of the work the Democrats did on it, actually recommended restorations. It just got stalled out in the budget and then subsequent, you know, Senate and conference and all of that. So um, we will continue to fight this fight because it's the only good thing to do. It's a billion dollars. And I know you've heard me say that, and I continue to say it. As of this budget cycle, it will be a billion dollars. By the time you vote in November 2008, it'll be almost a billion and a half because it increases our, our what we leave as tax dollars on the table increases every year. It will be a billion and a half almost by the time you vote in November 2008 that we're sending back to Washington? That we're sending, frankly, to other states, yes. Washington keeps it, doesn't give it to us. It's there to redistribute to Massachusetts, California, Illinois, Wisconsin, all those great states that are headed toward putting all of their children on health care and making a universal health care system to make sure that every citizen in their, in their jurisdiction gets the health care that they need. We are, this is fiduciarily irresponsible. And I'm not afraid to say it. I asked the governor in one of my speeches on the floor, governor, release the money. Because we actually have enough money, as you all now have read, $320 million left on the table. Only half of that would have made the restorations we asked for and they still would have had enough left over to do many good other things like building a health science center at the state university. Unconscionable, inexcusable, I can come up with lots of words for this. I just hope that the ballot box is, you know, the ballot box might be our only resort here. We have to just get out there and use it. Make sure it's used, used, used and used by more and more of your neighbors. So those are the things I thought I'd talk with you all about. I wanted to leave plenty of time for you to ask questions because you're always full of very articulate, thoughtful questions, and I'd like to hear some of them. David. Judy, on your um, statement on the uh, K through 12 education and on higher education and so about teachers at the same institution occasionally, um, isn't that also, for the public issue, also a poverty issue? Um, here, the uh, building school elementary is, is one of the poorer schools and has one of the poorest rankings under the math test right now. Uh, with your uh, uh, Green Caucus, American Green Caucus, how do you intend or what's the current vision on dealing with the K through 12 issue and poverty? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, David wants to know um, how, the, how a poverty agenda can uh, help us with the K through 12 agenda as well, uh, which is a really good question because poverty in our schools, and he mentioned field elementary being one of those uh, that particularly is affected by this. Um, uh, 
part of our agenda, we have not lighted upon the top five, but within our discussions, we've talked a lot about early childhood education as one of the ways to attack poverty, believe it or not. Of course, health care will be another. Uh, the earned income tax credit so that um, parents of uh, children that are living in poverty who are working very hard to uh, usually one or two jobs, sometimes three, uh, to and have very little time for their families when they get home, perhaps an earned income tax credit will give them a little bit of the margin that they need to spend a little bit more time with their children. Um, so that's a, that's a big one that's, that's on the agenda. Payday loans is on the agenda because payday loans takes an inordinate amount of money out of our communities uh, and gives it to corporations even outside the state of Missouri. A, a, real, a really big redistribution of wealth, so to speak, from the poor to the wealthy outside our state. Yes, ma'am. As I understand it, some of the allegedly improvements, alleged improvements in the health bill with the health net, such as putting dental and visual back in there, are actually subject to appropriation? Good question. Okay. Has any money actually been appropriated for those? No. Good question. She's asking about, um, because there were um, touted these, these small restorations in dental and, and um, a few other services, optometry and that kind of thing, they actually did put those in there in the health care bill. Uh, but they are subject to appropriation, and we closed the budget even before they passed that subject to appro appropriation. We had already closed the budget. It was done, and there was no money for those things that they now can claim they have done as restorations, but there was no money put towards those. So I asked our budget um, analyst on the floor of the House, I asked, I said, so on these issues, on these items, when the money runs out, there will be no more services. Is that correct? And she said, that is correct, Representative. So when the money runs out, there will be no services. So to say you did it, but not back it with money is, uh, again, inexcusable. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, in terms of the Health Care Policy Committee, has there been any discussion in your committee dealing with the biocontainment labs and the issues at level three and level four? in terms of um, bringing testing of MPAX and West Nile disease into both the University and Columbia? Those were not dealt with in the Health Care Committee, no. Uh, was there any information provided by the University at any time in terms of the nature of the facilities in the health, in the life sciences center, which does already test MPAX those, anything like that did not come through the committee I was on. There were, f there's four health care committees, so I can't speak for the other committees. Um, and there's s a few other committees that might have dealt with that, but I am unaware. Uh, is there any way you could find that out for us? I mean, those of us who are very stressed out by the nature of and lack of transparency in terms of what's been going on, I mean, we all know that it's, it's ba a bad thing to have stem cell research that might save lives, but nobody informs anybody about what might happen if lightning struck one of those facilities, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, if you could. I, I don't recall that being raised, but I will try and find out. So